At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue. And a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, uh, what a great passage we have before us today, friends. Before we dive into there, though, um, just a couple of quick things from me. Uh, I mentioned last week that we're planning to have baptisms uh, just before Easter. The Sunday before Easter is the plan, the 10th of April, uh, and a few weeks leading up to that to have some classes to talk about what that means. Uh, so it'd be great for you to join in on that. Uh, if you haven't spoken to me about that and you want to um, explore getting baptised yourself, please do. Uh, those classes I mentioned last week will also be good for people who just want a, um, a refresher on what your baptism means, perhaps just someone who's already been baptised. Uh, but more info about that to those who uh, come and chat to me today or leave a message in the, in the box and that'll get through to me. Uh, the other quick thing is to just put before you that our Impact Camp is happening next week. Impact is for uh, youth from three different Trinity churches, from our church, um, Mount Barker and Aldgate. Uh, it's a great weekend away, uh, uh, lots of fun, uh, great teaching. Uh, so please do pray for that. Um, and uh, if you are in that category and want to go and haven't registered yet, there's still time to. So we'd love to have you there. Let me pray for us and then we'll dive in. Our great God and Heavenly Father, it's so easy to feel hopeless in this world. But we know that in Christ we have a source of hope that can never be put out. 
we have a sure and certain hope for the whole world. Our God, I pray, we pray today that as we come before this passage that you might um, just show each of us in some way something more of your hope, of the hope that we have in him. Ignite in us, please, uh, the, the longing for uh, Christ's return. Uh, ignite in us a deep hopefulness in a hopeless world. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, how hopeful are you? for this world <laughs> uh, how hopeful are you like uh, how hopeful are you for your future maybe for the future of your kids or your grandkids hope uh, hope looks to the future right and it sees in there some reason for confidence in the present uh, it sees something good and something bright in the future that kind of draws us towards it uh, and I don't know, but I, well, I reckon probably everyone's in the same boat. There seems to be lots of reasons at the moment not to be very hopeful. <laughs> uh, there's a whole lot of things that have been going on for a long time. Um, obviously, the big one that's uh, really brought to our attention in the last week, is, the last couple of weeks, is Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. And, and the world kind of feels like on a bit of a knife edge there. What hope is there? What hope do you have? In a world that is so fractured, in a world that is so fragile. This passage in Matthew 12, it puts before us this portrait of Jesus. It's a stunning portrait of Jesus that we're going to uh, think about today. It's a portrait, of, a reality about Jesus that gives you a deep, inexhaustible well of hope, of hope. Hope for you as an individual and hope for the whole world. Hope for the whole world. Uh, not everyone sees this hope. Not everyone sees it. Uh, it's hidden from some and it's revealed to others. We read that a few weeks back. If you were with us a few weeks ago, uh, we heard that God had hidden these things from the wise and learned, uh, those sort of people who are, are proud in their own power and intellect, uh, who think that they can figure out God and life by themselves. Uh, God has actually hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children, Jesus says, to, to those who come humbly and empty-handed before his throne of grace, ready to receive what God has actually received, uh, revealed about himself. So uh, that, that was a couple of weeks ago. And what you see in this chapter is actually a lot of the things that we've already looked at played out in, in sort of um, e live examples of what Jesus was talking about in chapter 11. You see that reality played out here. It's the wise and learn learned, uh, the religious leaders of the time, the Pharisees, they can't see Jesus. He's hidden from them. They're blind to who he is. Uh, the chapter opens with, with this extraordinary, uh, no, not extraordinary, uh, the opposite, ordinary scene. It's a really ordinary scene. It's a really ordinary, everyday scene the chapter opens with in verse 1. Uh, Jesus and his disciples are walking together through some grain fields. Um, his disciples get hungry, they be begin to pick some heads of the grain to eat. It's a really ordinary scene. Uh, this kind of going through your neighbour's grain field is, was actually something that uh, was allowed for in the Old Testament law. Uh, Deuteronomy 23, you can look it up if you want later. Uh, it says, if you went to your neighbour's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hand, but you not, must not put a sickle to their standing grain. So don't go in and sort of cut down a, a lot of it. But if you're walking past, pick a few heads of grain uh, to, keep you, to, to keep you satisfied, that's fine. So it's a really ordinary scene, but there is something about it that gets these Pharisees really going in verse 2. Uh, Jesus and his disciples are doing this on the Sabbath. They're doing it on the Sabbath. Uh, the, the Sabbath, you might know, is, was a, a weekly day of rest for the Jewish people. So from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, uh, God had given them this kind of regular rhythm to their week uh, to rest and to meet with God and his people and to remind themselves of the, the rest that they had with, with Yahweh, with the Lord. Uh, and, and God had said to his people, they weren't to do any work on the Sabbath, and here we've got Jesus letting his disciples work, or at least according to the Pharisees, on the Sabbath day. 
Uh, what's going on here? Uh, the Old Testament law was actually pretty fairly light on the details of what it meant to work on the Sabbath day. It didn't go into lots of details. So by Jesus' time, the, the religious leaders had developed this kind of system of extra rules, going into detail about what you could and couldn't do on the Sabbath. Uh, so they had, uh, uh, they had 39 categories of things that were forbidden on the Sabbath. They included things like carrying, burning, extinguishing, finishing, writing, erasing, cooking. It went on and on. And one of them was reaping, cutting or plucking any growing thing. Well, uh, that, that sort of went so far as to sort of talk about not even uh, touching any growing thing for some people. So you weren't allowed to climb trees or even smell living flowers. Um, and... You can, you can understand the motive behind this, right? I think this is the kind of motive. God, God tells us to not work on the Sabbath, but he hasn't given us an exhaustive set of rules about what that looks like. So to stop us going anywhere near breaking God's law, we're going to create a whole set of extra rules around the outside, uh, sort of extra rules for, for ourselves. But while it seems quite earnest... Uh, actually, what Jesus reveals to, it, to us here is it actually reveals a heart that is, that is actually quite far away from God. Uh, it's an outworking of what gets, you might have heard the term legalism, what gets called legalism. It, it, and it reveals something important about how you see God. For the legalist, God is primarily someone to keep happy by performing a bunch of rules. That's your kind of relationship with God. It's a relationship in which you can never really have assurance um, because your acceptance is always based on your own righteousness, your own capacity to keep the rules. Friends, this, I think, is actually a constant feature of the religions of the world. And it places heavy burdens on people. Legalism places heavy burdens on people. But what did we hear last week? <laughs> Jesus' yoke is easy. His burden is light. And he calls weary and burdened people to come to him for rest, including those who are weary of the burden of trying to earn their acceptance with God through their own works, through religious observance. Jesus offers not our own righteousness but his righteousness he offers us his righteousness as a free gift given to all who will come to him in faith who will trust in him but what's really interesting here is that jesus doesn't start to sort of argue with the pharisees about these sabbath rules do you notice that as you keep reading um, he does something that he does a lot of the time <laughs> Uh, he could have done that. He could have started arguing. You see, uh, there, there was nothing actually in the scriptures about plucking grain on the Sabbath. Uh, as we looked at earlier, that was the kind of Pharisee's extra rule that they'd created around the outside. It wasn't God's. So it could, Jesus could have got, sort of started arguing about that and, and shown why they were wrong. But he doesn't do that. This is, I think this is really interesting and quite important. Uh, he does what he does so often in these conversations. He changes the subject. Um, but it's not him just deflecting because he doesn't, he's afraid of dealing with the issue. That's not what he's, what's going on. It's like he's raising the level of the conversation to a much bigger and much more important level. Uh, he, he doesn't want to be kind of drawn into this tortured debate about what the rules are. He wants to talk about who gets to set the rules in the first place. Who gets to set the rules in the first place? I, the, the argument can be a little hard to follow that Jesus goes through with these Pharisees, his, his train of thought, but I, I think the Pharisees would have understood what he was saying. So Jesus, in verse 3, let's keep uh, kind of looking through the passage, he points to this episode in the life of David, Israel's greatest king. And he says, uh, he says haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? Uh, so this was, this was before David had actually become king and he was on the run for his life. 
Um, he uh, he kind of he's on the he's on the run. He's fleeing for his life, and he he breaks the rules. So he goes into the tabernacle, the place of God's presence among Israel before the temple was built. Uh, and he eats the bread in the tabernacle that was consecrated uh, for that was a whole sort of set apart. It was consecrated. And, and in verse 4, you read that no one was allowed to eat this bread except the priests. But David and his men go ahead and do it. They eat it. Um, that there's, there's sort of lots we get into here, but what's Jesus' big point? What is this, and, and what does this have to do with picking grain on the Sabbath? Jesus seems to be saying this. He seems to be saying, look, if it was okay for David and his men to do this because of who David was, right, who David was, God's anointed Messiah. If, if it was okay for, for David to do that, how much more, he's kind of saying to the Pharisees, if you really understood who was standing in front of you, who you're accusing of being against God and his law, if you really understood that, it would be unthinkable for you to accuse me of being against God in his way. He's making this incredible claim to be greater even than the great king, David. And he just keeps pressing this home with these, uh, like these claims that would have been so offensive to the Pharisees he was talking to. He pressed, in verse 5, he gives another example. He says, the priests break the Sabbath every week. Uh, they have to do work in order to kind of perform their priestly duties. But they weren't sinning in doing that. And, and it all comes to a head in verse 6. And this is, I think, uh, one of the key things, Jesus, the key thing Jesus is saying here. Jesus says something, it's easy to kind of gloss over, but is one of the most stunning things he could have said at this point. Verse 6, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. This is the key point Jesus is making. So the temple was uh, the, God's, uh, the wonderful symbol of God's presence among his people. It was the center of life for the people of Israel. Not only was it they, they, their kind of center of light, but it represented, actually, in the big story of the Bible, it represented the hope of the world. Israel and its temple were to be a, a light to the nations. Uh, they were to be the place where God was undoing the curse of sin, where God's blessing would come to the nations. And here's Jesus saying, something greater than that is here right now with him. So the Pharisees get what Jesus is saying here. That's why, did you pick that up as we read through? That's why they, tr they end up plotting to kill him, <laughs> like at the end of this interaction. He's making the stunning claim that what the temple pointed towards, God's presence, God's blessing, what the temple pointed towards was now fully and perfectly here in him. In him. Jesus is God in the flesh. So you don't need to go to a building. You come to him. You come to him. All the Old Testament leads to him, to Jesus. The temple sacrifices point to him as the ultimate sacrifice. The priests point to him as the true mediator between God and humanity. Uh, the kings point to him as the true ultimate Messiah and Lord. The prophets point to him as the true and final word. He fulfills it all. He is what it's all straining towards and longing for. And so now that he is here, the old has gone. Not because the old was bad, but because what it always pointed towards is now here is now here. And he, he shows the Pharisees that they've had it all wrong. God isn't looking for people uh, to try to bend his arm with their own rule keeping. That's not the kind of relationship God is looking for. He wants sons and daughters who know him through his grace. And so he, he 
Jesus keeps going and he quotes again from the scriptures, from the book of Hosea. He says in verse 7, If you'd known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the one. We reflected on this last week. He's the one who brings true, eternal soul rest. The kind of rest that Israel's Sabbath was like a token of, a, a sign pointing towards. In Him, by faith, we live in a permanent, 24-7, complete Sabbath rest, a rest that we experience now in part and that will be made perfect in the new creation. There's so much there we could talk about, but you get the big pic picture of what Jesus is saying. He's saying, it, by definition, it is impossible for the Lord of the Sabbath to break the Sabbath. <laughs> it's impossible for the Lord of the Sabbath to break the Sabbath. But in, in their pride, the Pharisees don't see this. So they set this kind of trap for Jesus. It's interesting as you, as you keep reading, it moves from the grain fields into the synagogue. Jesus goes there in verse 9. It uh, would have been his habit on the Sabbath. And then in verse 10, the, you read uh, there's a man with a shriveled hand there. That was unusual. Um, it wouldn't have been there normally. And I think we're supposed to read here that this is a setup um, that's been sort of orchestrated by the Pharisees. They're, they're using this poor man as a pawn in their game, a kind of bait to trap Jesus. And so the, the Pharisees bring this guy before Jesus, and in verse 10 they say, uh, it says, uh, looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. So that's their motivation, looking for a reason to bring charges. They ask him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? You can kind of, like, they're, they're goading him, Right? And again, Jesus just sees through their legalism. He goes straight to the heart of the law. He says in verse 11, he said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So the man stretched it out and was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. It's interesting, isn't it? It's not okay to pick grain or to heal someone on the Sabbath, but it is okay to plan a murder. <laughs> you know, like, that's the kind of... It just shows you where their heart really is at. It shows you where their heart really is at. Well, so we've got these wise and learned ones. The religious leaders, uh, they can't see the eternal hope that Jesus holds out, the global hope that he holds out. If they couldn't see it, <laughs> if they couldn't see it, who could? Who can? Well, it wasn't people who came to Jesus sort of full of themselves, relying on their own righteousness. It was people who knew they couldn't do life on their own. It was people who knew they needed help. It was people who saw in Jesus the one who could give them real rest. So in verse 15, Jesus heads away from the synagogue. He kind of leaves these enraged, murderous Pharisees behind. And it says, a large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. So this is turning out to be a very busy Sabbath day for Jesus. <laughs> He's hard at work doing good, restoring a fallen creation, showing mercy. He's not the Messiah they were expecting. <laughs> That's pretty clear. He's not the... And, and that... The, the, um, He's hidden to many, and I think that's why in verse 16 he says to, pe to, to the people he's healed, he says to them not to tell others. You get this sort of throughout the Gospels, not to tell others about him. He doesn't want to stir up kind of wrong expectations about who he is and what he'll do, what sort of a king he's going to be. But as Matthew 
records this for us and he looks back at this, uh, he, wants, he, he wants to show us that in this interaction, in all of the things that he's been recording for us, he sees the wonderful fulfillments of all Israel's hopes. Uh, he points to this key passage in Isaiah. It talks about God's servant king. Uh, we'll actually look more closely at this later in the year when we're, we'll be back in Isaiah later in the year. Uh, so we'll have a, another crack at this, um, this great passage. But notice that how it matches beautifully everything that we've been looking at over the last few weeks about Jesus. So Jesus is like, the, he's the matchless King of Kings, the one with all authority, the eternal Son of the Father who alone reveals the Father to the world. Uh, he's the one who fulfills all of God's purposes, who sits at the centre of all history. And at the same time, he is the one who is gentle and humble in heart, whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. And you see both of those things in this prophecy from Isaiah, Isaiah 42 that Matthew quotes. Uh, verse 7 of Matthew 12 says, This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. So this Lord of the Sabbath is also this, the chosen servant of the Lord from Isaiah, anointed with the Spirit to bring justice to the nations, to the whole world. And did you notice that as we read through, his justice will be brought through to victory. He is unstoppable. And yet, or maybe not and yet, and also... <laughs> In total contrast to all the powerful ones in our world, he isn't quarrelsome and self-promoting. He deals gently with bruised reeds and smouldering wicks. Now, there should be a picture on the slide of some bruised reeds and smouldering a smouldering wick. Uh, reeds were used in all sorts of things um, at that time, all sorts of kind of common usage around the home. They were a dime a dozen, and so if you pick one and it's a little bit bruised, uh, it's no, you just chuck it away, right? You just get rid of it. It's useless. Uh, it, it's a metaphor that's being used here, right? People can feel like bruised reeds. It's an image of weak, vulnerable people. Uh, it's the same with that smouldering wick image. It's a, a picture of a candle. It's still just burning, but it's about to go out at any second. A bruised reed he will not break. A smouldering wick he will not snuff out. Friends, maybe you do today feel like a bruised reed. A smouldering wick. Fragile, maybe not worth very much about to be snuffed out. What hope could there be for you? What hope could there be for you? Well, it is the hope that Isaiah foretold and that Matthew bore witness to. In verse 21, in his name, the nations will put their hope. In his name, the nations will put their hope. What would it take, friends? What would it take for you to live in hope? In hope. Not a kind of naive hope that ignores reality, <laughs> but in strong, certain hope. What would it take for you to live like that? What would it take for you to pray earnestly over the next few months that God 
would give you someone to invite and bring along to our Hope Explored course next term? What would it take for you to long for a world that knows Jesus so that you seriously support our mission partners through CMS and uh, the Bush Church Aid and others? What would it take even for you to consider going yourself to a place that is less reached with the gospel? What would it take to commit yourself to Jesus and his way? We've got an alarm activated. If you're watching on, you can't hear that. We've got an alarm going on in the building. I'll just pause for a second. Let's see if we can get it stopped. I think it's someone in a different part of the school. What do you reckon? Can you can you just block it out? Will I just keep... <laughs> is, is th that's hope, right? That pause right there, that's, that's hope defined. No, it's someone in a different part of the school and we can't um, turn that alarm off from here. So we'll just have to wait till they turn it off. And I... Hello? Oh, I think I might have turned myself off, sorry. Okay. I'm going to keep going. Uh, as we live in hope for that to stop. <laughs> uh, where was I up to? Uh, we are thinking about what it would take, friends, for you to live deeply in hope. So in hope that you would commit yourself to Jesus in his way, even when it goes against the desires of your own heart. What would it take for you to have hope even in the worst circumstances in this life? Through floods or fire or famine or even earthquake? We had an, do, you, do you guys feel that this morning? Uh, through war or persecution? Through sickness? Even through death? What would it take for all of that? It would take you being deeply convicted that Jesus is the hope of the world. Jesus is the hope, the hope of the world. He really is the Son who alone reveals the Father. He really is the fulfillment of God's good purposes, the King who will bring justice to the nations, even if we never see it in our life. The one who will also deal gently with all, with all who come to him in repentance and faith, who can replace your burdens with his rest. So friends, I just want to finish by asking you whether you know this Jesus as this hope, as this hope, because the great proclamation of the gospel is that Jesus is Lord. He died and rose again, is now seated at the right hand of the Father, and by his Spirit, he is calling people from every nation to come to him, to find peace with him. And he's doing that until the day he returns to make everything new. I was trying to think of an example, a story to kind of illustrate this, and I'll finish with this. It's not actually from me. It's one of the most moving things I sort of came across during the week. I couldn't think of a better example than this. Uh, it's uh, Christians in Ukraine right now, um, and they've recorded themselves saying together Psalm 30, 31. I don't know if you've seen this, but we're going to watch the video now. It is a, 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 an incredible example of uh, Christians who know a hope that is deeper and broader and brighter than the worst of circumstances um, and yeah I, it's deeply encouraging so can we play the video now please <laughs> 
На тебе надійся, Господи, хай не буде повік засоромлений. Визволь мене в своїй правді. Нахили своє ухо до мене, скоро мене порятуй. Стань для мене могутньою скелою, дом твердий, щоб спасти мене. Я зненавиджу всіх, хто шанує болваних марних. Я ж надіюсь на Господа. Я буду радіти та тішитись в Твоїй милості, що побачив Тебе родію, що приглянувся до безпроботи моєї душі. І мене не віддав в руку ворога, на місці розлоги поставив Ти ноги мої. Помилив мене, Господи, бо тісно мені, від горя вже виснажилось у моєму мені, душа моя і нутро моє. Бо скінчилось життя моє в смутку, а роки мої у квилінні. Моя сила спіткнулася через мій гріх, і виснажились мої кості. Я в усіх ворогів своїх став посміховищем, надто сусідом своїм. І страхіттям знайомим моїм, хто бачить на дворі мене, утікають від мене. Я забутий у серці, немов той небіжник, став я немов та розбита посудина. Бо чую багато шептання, страхання навколо, як змовляються разом на мене. Вони замишляють забрати мою душу. А я покладаю надію на тебе, о Господи. Я кажу, ти мій Бог. В твою руку кладу свою долю. Ти ж визволь мене від руки ворогів моїх і моїх переслідників. Засяй світлом свого обличчя на твого раба. Спаси мене у своєму милосерді. Господи, не дай мені осоромитись, адже я кличу до тебе. Нехай осоромляться нечестиві і змовкнуть у шоолі. Нехай заніміють обманливі уста, які зухвали зі зневагою, наговорюють на праведника. Яка ж велика твоя доброта, яку ти приготував для тих, що тебе шанують та на тебе покладаються, і виявляєш її перед усіма людськими нащадками. Ти їх у заслонні обличчя свого заховаєш від людських тенет. Ти їх від лихих язиків у наметі сховаєш. Благословений Господь, що вчинив мені милість чудову свою в оборонному місці. А я говорив у своїм побентеженні. Я відрізаний сперед очей твоїх. Та дійсно, ти вислухав голос благання мого, коли я до тебе взивав. Любіть Господа, усі святі Його. Стереже Господь вірний, а гордому злишком відплачує. Будьте сильні, і хай буде міцне ваше серце. Усі, хто надію покладає на Господа. Псалом 31. Come on, pray for us. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Oh, our God, give us this kind of hope. Equip your people around the world to live in this kind of hope that in Jesus we have the one who is greater than the temple, the one who fulfills all your promises and purposes, uh, the one who is your presence among us, the one who has paid for our sin, Uh, the one who draws us to you, our Father. The one who will bring justice to the nations. And the one who will not break bruised reeds. Who deals tenderly and carefully with smoldering wicks. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he gives us this source of hope. Make us people who long more and more for his appearing. And we pray that for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.